Oh, Bob. You left something out. On the 12th of May, 2017, movie Bob Chipman, under the masthead of his long-running web video series The Game Overthinker, published a top 10 list of what he regards to be the best video gaming consoles of all time. If you want to know what it was, I'm not going to spoil it for you here. Go check it out for yourself. However, conspicuously absent from his list is what I regard to be one of the most significant gaming consoles ever released. Although it never enjoyed the monster success of, say, the NES, its creation nevertheless sent ripples throughout the industry that were felt for well over a decade. And no, I'm not referring to the Sega Saturn, or the Neo Geo, or the Atari Jaguar, or the Vectrex, or the Mattel Intellivision, or the ColecoVision, or the Fairchild Channel F, or the Magnavox Odyssey, or even Pong. Although Pong arguably does belong in that list, because although it only ever played one game, it set the stage for everything that was to come after it. And people who have followed my series of videos for any length of time probably already know what it is. The 3DO Interactive Multiplayer. Now, for newcomers, I should point out right up front that my opinion on this matter is in absolutely no way whatsoever objective. I used to work for 3DO, I wrote one of the launch titles, and many of my colleagues from that time are still treasured friends. And I imagine some would-be clever people would attempt to point out that the 3DO ultimately failed in the marketplace and is therefore not worthy of note. Well, so did the Sega Dreamcast, and it made Bob's list, so what does that say about your priorities? I would contend that 3DO's significance is measured best not by the size of its market share, but by the impact that it had throughout the entire gaming industry, because 3DO set out to do four fairly ambitious things. One, create the best damn video gaming console that existed up to that point, which would have been a heavy enough lift all on its own. Two, make the game cartridge obsolete and replace it with a CD-ROM. Three, democratize game publishing. And four, make a standard video gaming platform that could be manufactured by multiple vendors. On the first goal, 3DO was an unqualified success. And if you disagree, you are simply wrong. 3DO at that time was the most powerful and the most sophisticated console to ever exist up to that point. And while it is presented as common knowledge that the Sony PSX surpassed it, 3DO still retained several technical advantages over the PSX that it simply could not overcome. Obviously, that made no difference whatsoever in the PSX becoming a smash success, but if you're going to claim total technological superiority, expect an argument. The second and third goals, democratize game publishing and make the cartridge obsolete, were actually interrelated. You see, prior to the introduction of 3DO, the two dominant consoles were the 8-bit NES and the 16-bit Sega Genesis, both of which took their games in the form of ROM-based cartridges. Uh, these cartridges were manufactured exclusively by Nintendo and Sega, respectively, who could and did charge third-party developers usurious prices for them and constantly dick them around on delivery schedules and manufacturing quantities. What developers wanted was broadly similar to what already existed for home computers at that time, a delivery medium that was inexpensive to manufacture and could be manufactured by anybody, not just a single source. And by the early 1990s, that was seen as the compact disc. There had been previous efforts to capitalize on the compact disc as a software delivery medium. Uh, Philips' CDI, the least said about which, the better. Microsoft's MPC specification, which even Microsoft knew was a pathetic joke the moment they released it. And Commodore's CDTV and CD32, which basically took an Amiga computer and stuck it inside a stereo component's clothing and a clamshell style console, respectively. All four of them sank like a stone in the market, causing many self-styled pundits to opine that CD-ROM was dead and not going anywhere. But 3DO's founder Trip Hawkins didn't agree, because during his previous gig as CEO and founder of an obscure software publishing company called Electronic Arts, uh, had been on the receiving end of the aforesaid dicking around from Nintendo and Sega and was keen on putting an end to it. And he came to the conclusion that the best way to go about doing that would be to establish his own gaming platform. Now, before it starts to sound like I'm giving Trip Hawkins all the credit, he enabled 3DO, but he did not actually create it. That accolade belongs principally to these two guys, Dave Needle and RJ Michael, who, along with Dave Morse, who was running the business side of things, were running a small company called New Technologies Group at the time. 
Tripp knew them from their earlier work in the computing industry, having previously created a cute little gadget called the Atari Lynx, the world's first color handheld video gaming system. Yeah, it's kind of chunky. What do you expect for the year 1989? And prior to that, they had uh, made a modest little uh, offering called the Amiga Computer. which uh, all by itself deserves a 12-part Ken Burns documentary. So when Tripp starts looking around for somebody to build his CD-ROM-based gaming console, it turns out RJ and Dave are already working on one, codenamed Opera. Tripp agreed to back it and rechristened it 3Do. We, we, we really didn't like the name at the time. It, none of us, we, we thought it was silly. Uh, that's why none of us are in marketing. So now, armed with a viable gaming platform, Trip sets forth his grand scheme. The 3DO company, unlike Nintendo and Sega, will not publish its own titles and will not compete with its third-party licensees, a promise that they later broke. Unlike Nintendo and Sega, which charged $9 or more per cartridge, the 3DO company would only charge a licensing fee of $3 per CD-ROM pressed. Another promise that they later broke through what I thought was a kind of cheesy semantic dodge. And unlike Nintendo and Sega, 3DO would impose no restrictions on publishers and you could get your CD-ROMs made wherever you wanted. If you were a publisher with a what you thought was a fantastic idea, no matter how weird it was, stamp out as many CD-ROMs as you want and let the free market decide your fate. Now, admittedly, uh, that hands-off policy resulted in a title catalog that varied wildly in quality. Plumbers Don't Wear Ties was just bizarre. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 3DO's liberal policy gave some small developers their first start. Way of the Warrior, for example, was the first title ever developed by a new developer named Naughty Dog. And uh, two of 3DO's earliest titles, Total Eclipse and the launch title Crash and Burn, were both developed by a new studio called Crystal Dynamics who were two doors down from us, as it turns out. So, democratize game publishing and make the proprietary cartridge obsolete. How did 3DO fare on both of those goals? Well, on the first one, only partially. Although things are a bit looser today than they were before 3DO, and there is a thriving indie development community, uh, console game development is still tightly controlled by the console manufacturer, ostensibly to prevent the emergence of an app store swamped with garbage. As for establishing the CD-ROM as a software delivery medium, well, a strong argument could be made that that was going to happen anyway, no matter who made the next great console. However, kindly observe that after 3DO, nearly every console released had an optical drive. Sega Saturn, Sony PSX, Xbox, Sega Dreamcast, Sony PS2, Xbox 360, PS3, PS4, and the X-Bone. Even Nintendo was forced to concede the point with the GameCube, the Wii, and the Wii U. 3DO's last goal was considerably more ambitious. Establish a standard gaming platform that could be made by multiple manufacturers. When describing this goal, Trip Hawkins' model for this was the VHS VCR. Ask your parents. A consumer electronic device that was manufactured by dozens of manufacturers for over 30 years. Competition between those vendors drove the price from its initial release price of over $1,200 in the 1970s down to well under $300 by 1993. So through liberal licensing, 3DO hoped to stimulate that same kind of competition that would drive down the price of its console from its initial release price of $700. And actually managed to bring on three hardware partners, Matsushita through its Panasonic brand, uh, Sanyo, and Goldstar, who we know today as LG. And being honest, it worked. Sort of. A bit. Uh, if you put a 3DO disc in any one of those three machines, it worked and some cost reduction did take place. Panasonic uh, refreshed the FC1 to the FC10, uh, replacing the motorized CD-ROM drawer with a lower cost clamshell design. Unfortunately, it didn't take place at the speed or scale necessary and no new hardware vendors came on. And those of you who are even dimly familiar with Moore's Law have probably worked out that 1993 level gaming technology, even the amazing technology that RJ and Dave had come up with, wasn't going to last more than a few years, and certainly not the 15 years that VHS had existed up to that point. Even if you ignore the technological issues, 3DO had kind of painted itself into a corner with its business model as well. 
By establishing itself, at least initially, as a technology licensing company, 3DO really didn't have the leverage that they wanted over the hardware vendors to drive cost reduction or marketing efforts. But the list of things they did manage to accomplish is impressive enough. The world's first 32-bit gaming console, the world's first successful CD-ROM-based console, and the first console with an explicitly open-door developer policy. And no, the Atari 2600 doesn't count because Atari's parent company, Warner Communications, fought tooth and nail to prevent that from happening. An argument could be made that 3DO also influenced the industry by the stuff they screwed up. For example, the only supported platform for developing 3DO software was the Mac. Back when the Mac sucked. Nobody's made that mistake again. So who would I remove from Movie Bob's list and replace with the 3DO? Well, to be honest, I can't think of any entry that doesn't deserve to be there. I guess my gripe is that the list was too narrow in its scope. 3DO today may be relegated as a mere footnote in gaming history, but it's a whacking huge footnote with a lot of stories behind it, and it got a lot of attention by some enormously talented people who I had the very great privilege of being able to work with. And since we're here, let me add a couple of footnotes to the footnote. So when the 3DO finally shipped, naturally, they started working on the follow-on console, a 64-bit system codenamed M2. Sadly, it never really went anywhere. Uh, Matsushita made a few obscure kiosk systems out of it, but that was about it. However, when the 3DO company finally converted completely over to game development, they spun off the hardware group into its own company called Cajent, which in turn was acquired by Microsoft. And that group helped create what became the first Xbox. Cool story, huh? That isn't even the punchline. The punchline is that when it came time for them to do the next Xbox, they started by trying to beef up the stripped-down PC that the Xbox was internally and discovered very quickly that it was going to take far too long and cost far too much. So the Cajun guys, they go, ignore this x86 garbage, let's design a brand new system built around a multi-core power PC with a unified memory architecture. You know how traditional PCs, they've got isolated chunks of RAM. This one's just for graphics. This one's just for sound. This one's just for the CPU. And you spend all kinds of time with them talking, copying data between them. No, no, no. Unified memory architecture. There's one chunk of RAM and everything can talk to it. Game developers love this. And as a consequence of that decision, the Xbox 360 came in at the price point that they wanted a year ahead of the Sony PS3. And the reason those guys were completely convinced that they could pull something like that off is because, broadly speaking, They'd already done it. That was the base architecture of the 3DO M2. Thank you, Bob, for everything that you do. The, the amount of work it's taken to put together just this dumb talking head video gives me a much deeper appreciation of what you do to bring us your stuff every week. So thank you. And to the rest of you who stopped in to visit, thank you all very kindly for the gracious gift of your time and attention and letting me rant and rave. See you next time.